In this grim future of ours, there is only war. It has evolved in so many ways from the simplicity of old. We've developed new ways, sundry, foul ways of killing. We've cast ships of steel and iron into the void, sporting weapons that can scour a world of all life. We have wrought data jinn to take the conflict into the realm of the binaric. We even war with our minds, ethereal battles in a new space of pure idea forms. Yet, despite this, the galaxy, hateful as it so often is, opts to make room for the baser modes of strife, to allow war to be reduced to the horrid bluntness of muddy industrial slaughter, for a planet to be turned into a carnal house of churning bodies, split flesh, and rivers of vitae reddening the salty earth. The type of war where lives are spent as easily as ammunition, where soldiers are as much a line item on a requisition form as artillery shells. One such conflict arose in the latter years of M41, scant centuries ago. One that served a reminder that, though we may live in a future far removed from the wars of our past, the world can still so readily pivot to men slogging through a trench, defying choking gases and sucking mud only to die nameless and unmourned on a world that hates them for a regime that doesn't even care. Know then that this is the first in a series of records concerning this conflict, of a campaign as infamous as it is now hatefully iconic. The Siege of Vrax. For such an infamous chapter in Imperial history, this particular conflict began fairly inauspiciously, with the long-expected death of a priest. Cardinal Astra Borja of the Scarus Sector passed to his Emperor Grant a reward in 366-804-M41 at the age of 400, his natural life having been greatly extended by juvent treatments that his position had granted to him and others that his personal political power had allowed him to secure more of. A solid and dependable ecclesiastical presence in life, the long sweep of his tenure had allowed him to carefully secure for his successor an easy ascension to the cardinalship. Thus was the position easily and deftly passed to his successor, Zafan, without any of the necessities of politicking or bloodshed. As the bells tolled for the dearly departed Borja, who, it must be noted, had not left his seat upon San Artorus for two centuries, Zafan was enshrined as the new Cardinal Astra, with little in the way of any opposition raised from his contemporaries. Borja had been a powerful patron, and Zafan was a capable protege of his tutelage. Keen to minister to a flock he felt had been long deprived of the presence of this highest of religious offices, Zafan declared his first act as Cardinal Astra would be a grand pilgrimage to both honor the memory of the departed Borja and renew the faith of the sector's laity. It would appear the new cardinal was not only quite aware of the billions he was now expected to minister to, but also of his own failings in mendicancy, for at no point in his ecclesiastical career up to now had Zafan made any pilgrimage to any of the sundry holy sites abroad across Scarus sector. The retinue Zafan assembled was one designed to not only project the correct airs of authority and piety, but was additionally a uh, trial run to project his newfound power and influence, testing the waters, if you will, of just what the Cardinal Astra of Scarus was capable of wielding should he set his mind to it. A thousand strong, at least, 
It assembled not just the requisite deacons, preachers, chantelaines, choirs, and sacristans, but in quite a coup for the new cardinal, a detachment of battle sisters from the Adepta Sororitas, the Order of the Argent Shroud, to be precise. Thus arrayed with all the trappings of what was expected of the imperial ecclesiarchy, Zephan's pilgrimage began. The five-year arc of the Cardinal Astra's tour can be considered, at least initially, a riotous success, in some cases quite literally. In the two centuries since the previous Cardinal ensconced himself on his throne world, the Scara sector had grown somewhat religiously rudderless. Oh, the planetary establishments tended to the citizenry the same as always, with routine services and the everyday generality of purges, pogroms, and indoctrination persisting as usual. The arrival of religious leadership in the form of a soul-touring prelate was an event that shook the masses out of the humdrum of everyday church-sponsored terror and control, focusing their devotional energies now upon a single soul. Leadership is a tenuously wielded thing, and in Zafan, the flocks of Scarus were presented with a charismatic and, most importantly, new figure in which to vest their worship. It was a sharp rise in fanatical cults, aligned to the Church of the Emperor, yes, but outside its general control. The Redemptionists, the largest amongst them, pronounced the Cardinal's pilgrimage nothing short of a crusade to rid Scarus of its indolence, its apathy, and its quietly festering heresy. A spiritual renewal of the realm of his imperial majesty's domain that had grown fat off years of relative comfort. On Thracian Primaris, the outdoor ceremonies of Zaphan grew crowds that numbered in the millions with crushes and riots killing thousands as the frenzied masses attempted to get closer to his blessed figure, prompting harsh and bloody reprisals from both the local Arbites and Zafan's own Sororitas Honor Guard. Many of these faithful pledged themselves to the Cardinal, intending to sell their lives in his service. His entourage fleet rapidly bloated with ramshackle pilgrim transports and tuppenny bulk carriers, their holds crammed to the brim with the zealous citizenry of the sector. The word of Zafan, spilling from cheap recordings and the slavering lips of thousands of preachers, was a constant background noise on these ships, as persistent as the thrumming of their engine stacks. Their number soon began, to worried eyes, to resemble those of a small army, rather than a mere procession of the faith. It is likely that in this pilgrim horde, Zafan truly began to see the power of his position and the potential it represented. It may indeed have been initially from a place of virtue. The council chambers of the ecclesiarchal conclave on San Artorus contained a multitude of responsibilities and work, all of it good and just, of course, but here, Amongst the people of the Imperium, Zafan was able to watch his word work wonders. Perhaps in this he saw a calling or a truth, the work of the Emperor made manifest, his duty and his role being fulfilled in a very tangible manner. He was stirring the fervor of the laity with each sermon, his deliverances swelling the tides of the faithful with each passing day. The people were believing with a zeal that had not been seen throughout the sector for literally centuries. Real action was being taken, no presiding over conclaves, developing policy, or fine-tuning ignorable declarations. Surely this was good. Surely all was right in the world. The Cardinal was recorded to have voiced these opinions to his most trusted advisers, musing with those closest to him at what these feelings could mean for his new tenure in the office. Most demurred. The ecclesiarchy has a tenuous history in this particular regard. Memories of the Age of Apostasy persisted into M41, or rather, the inquisitorially mandated laws in memorial of that particular chapter of imperial history did. During his reign of blood, the tyrant Goge van Dyer had seized the power of both the administratum and the ecclesiarch, 
holding simultaneously two seats upon the High Lords of Terra, and ushering in a period of civil war that had not been seen since the Great Heresy. Control over not only the religion of the Imperium, but the faith of its devotees had been crucial to Van Dyer's power and his rise, leading, in the aftermath, to sweeping reforms being placed on the Ministorum's abilities to control men under arms. These laws were ruthlessly enforced by a wing of the Inquisition founded to do just that, the Ordo Hereticus. Many within Zafan's retinue quietly feared drawing their eyes at best, or their reprisal at worst. Polite accedence to the Cardinal's wishes was judged by these hangers-on to be the best course of action. All save one. Deacon Mammon, a young man recently joined after impressing Zafan during the ceremonies on Thracian Primaris, was favoured by the Cardinal for his forthrightness and his desire to see this pilgrimage as a force for good within the sector. A man of action, as Zephan was routinely heard to say of him, and one rising rapidly in favor because of it. Mammon openly declared that the pilgrimage need not simply be the simple preaching caravan, which should be actively developed and built upon, but the ultimate goal of becoming a war of faith. Playing to the Cardinal's desire, Mammon declared that Zafan was a great uniter, the leader that the Sector needed to bind the various wings of the Imperial Creed under one banner, the bringer of a great surge that would see the Sector scoured of the unclean and the heretical. The concept of a war of faith is not unknown within the Imperium. They are sanctioned reality for the Adeptus Ministorum, and serve a multitude of purposes beyond their simple military efficacy. They are the means by which the Ecclesiarchy may galvanize the faithful into action, and by which the Imperium may wield its copious manpower in an effective, if incredibly blunt, manner. In purely utilitarian, if horrific, terms, they are also the means by which the Inquisition may allow a culling of the more restive elements within imperial religious hierarchy. A demagogue is all well and good until you find yourself the object of their hatred, and wars of faith allow for that hatred to be directed just where the Imperium desires it to be, outward. The peak of wars of faith is widely considered to have been reached in the Age of Redemption from M37 to M38 but has remained, strictly speaking, well within the strictures of the Lex Imperialis, although crucially, they must be sanctified and approved by the High Ecclesiarch on Terra itself. A great degree of temporal, political, and religious influence is needed to properly secure such permission, and it goes without saying that the process is closely monitored by inquisitors of the Ordo Hereticus for any potential deviancy. It is these eyes that Zafan was wary of drawing, and that caution was actively stoked by Deacon Mammon. One false move, he warned, and the Cardinal would be clapped in irons by agents of the throne. There could even be eyes watching him right now, members of the retinue turned to the pay of scrutinizing bodies, or traitors seeking to sell the Cardinal Astra out for the sake of their own petty aims. Zafan began to agree with Mammon. His inner circle should be one he could rely upon, trusted individuals dedicated to his holy path to the exclusion of all else. The current chaos of the constantly shifting orderlies, priests, and sundry functionaries gave the Cardinal's enemies, as Mammon began to call them, ample opportunity to infiltrate. If Zafan were to see his heart's desire manifested, if the holy war that Scara's sector so desperately needed was to be delivered, the Cardinal would need a location, a planet even, secure and safe, where he could plan and prepare. Zafan wondered where could possibly exist such a world. Mammon said he knew of one. Vrax. Located in the Kirak subsector of Scarus, the Vrax system contains four planets Prime, Secundus, Tertius, and Eurix, of which Vrax Prime is the only inhabited world. Planet was an armory world, 
under the purview of the Departmento Munitorum, one of thousands scattered throughout the Imperium to serve as a planetary-scale storage facility for the materials the Imperium devours in its endless wars. Ammunition, weapons, armor, artillery, and military supplies of every variety, all stored in the event they are needed for the foundation of new regiments of the Astra Militarum, or the equipping of planetary defense forces, or as emergency reserves in a time of unexpected need. An unkind world that had begun its life cycle with highly volatile volcanic activity, Vrax has, over millions of years, settled into its current dormancy. While its tectonic movements were now negligible, the constant churning of minerals had created a crust that, through the millennia, had developed deep ravine canyons as the softer elements were scoured away by sudden and highly severe sulfuric electrical storms, themselves a product of mass ejections of gases during the planet's early life. The high sulfur content had the added benefit, at least for imperial colonization, of making native fauna non-existent beyond the level of simple single-celled bacteria. Such settlement occurred in the ancient times of the Great Crusade, when the planet had been discovered by a rogue trader of the Van Meer dynasty, a name now redolent in the naming of geographic features surrounding the capital. Initially a supply depot for the Great Crusade's expeditionary fleets in the Galactic North, the passage of the Great Heresy and the Scouring elevated it in importance, given its proximity to that most hated of galactic regions, the Eye of Terror. The majority of the traitor Astartes legions now confined within the storm, the fortification of the Cadian Gate becoming a top priority for segmentum authorities, the Adeptus Administratum, through the Departmento Munitorum, began the process of turning Vrax from a simple forward staging ground into a fortress. Its stockpiles were now contained within a mighty citadel, itself close to a newly constructed spaceport, allowing for the atmospheric landing of the mighty bulk haulers utilized by the Munitorum. All of this was expanded upon and added to as the millennia wore on, with certain periods usually in the wake of, or in anticipation of, the Black Crusades of the Despoiler, seeing massive reworking and updating of the defenses taking place. The cycle was a simple one. More storage was needed for more material, which meant more material was stored, which increased the risk of attack, which required greater defensive capabilities, etc., etc., all overseen by the exacting eye of the Munitorum, who ran the planet to the highest of standards from within the Fortress of Vrax. A massive citadel situated in the caldera of one of the planet's many extinct volcanoes, this fastness was a nerve center of all operations planetside, serving not just as the headquarters of the local defense forces and Adeptus Arbites, but also the offices and archives of the Administratum, the cells and precincts of the local inquisitorial branches, the Astropathic Choir, and the Palace of the Cardinal Astra. The fortress was also home to the Basilica of St. Leonis, raised in M38 with the intent of serving as a focal point for religious affairs of those presiding over the millions of indentured workers serving the Munitorum. These serfs formed the majority of the world's population, some five million strong, with a substantial proportion of these being made up of Ogryn abhumans, deemed priority for menial labor tasks. The presence of the Basilica drew a sizable pilgrim crowd, between one and five million depending on the season, while militarum regiments could occasionally be present for rearming and resupply. Generally speaking, the level of defenses present on Vrax were vastly disproportionate to its population, but completely in line with the amount of arms and armaments it possessed. To the Munitorum, it was essentially impregnable. The citadel was surrounded by high curtain walls and three ringed defense lines crammed with pillboxes, trenches, minefields, tank traps, and enfilades. The fortress itself had multiple inbuilt void shield generators to protect itself from orbital bombardments, and enough laser batteries to see off any airborne assault, batteries which could, if needed, fire upon ground targets, covering a 360-degree arc around the citadel in overlapping fields of fire. It was a masterwork of defensive capabilities, 
a true testament to the design and dedication of the Departmento Munitorum. And it was not to last. According to the enthusiastic Deacon Mammon, the Citadel of Rax would be the ideal location for the Cardinal's purposes. The Basilica and the Cardinal Palace had not seen the presence of the office for centuries. St. Leonis had been blinded and martyred by heretics during his own travels preaching the Emperor's word, and his bones, enshrined upon Vrax, still drew large pilgrim caravans. The symbolism inherent in the acts of Leonis, proclaimed Mammon, were ideal for continuing the tone Zaphan was seeking to set, as well as being a story that reminded the faithful of the wickedness of the heretic and the apostate. The pilgrims there would be eager in the extreme to hear the preaching of a cardinal Astra, and doing so would maintain Zaphan's fame as a man of the people. In private, Mammon was quick and earnest to state that Rax was perfect for allowing the cardinal both ideal time and ideal location to further his plan for his war of faith, as the strict passage requirements surrounding entry, rigorously monitored by the Departmento Munitorum, would naturally weed out any potentially traitorous elements from joining Zaphan's retinue. The Cardinal was fulsome in his praise of Mammon's plans, leaving the entirety of the logistics in his seemingly perfectly capable hands. Under the auspices of the pilgrimage, Imperial Navy transports were arranged, as were escort frigates. The Departmento Munitorum were informed, and, while surprised, acceded to the Cardinal's request for residence with little complaint, save for inquiries around the speed at which the ecclesiarchal decision had been made. Potential issues with this, and with security concerns, were ironed out rapidly by Deacon Mammon's silver tongue, assuring the Munitorum that he had all confidence in their ability to carry out any and all preparations in record time, such, of course, being their devotion to the Emperor's Church and its works. A frenzy of action ensued throughout the subsector, as ships were rerouted and astropathic messages shot back and forth, bearing the news. The new Cardinal Astra, the mendicant preacher of Scarus, the champion of the common man, was coming to Vrax, which would now become the true seat of religious authority within the sector. The arrival of Zaphan upon Vrax was an event accorded all the pomp and circumstance the Munitorum, eager to prove Mammon's faith in them well-placed, could muster. The entire garrison of the Citadel was marched out and lined the road to the spaceport in perfect parade order, banners fluttering in the sulphur-tinged winds. The storms, usually redolent of Vrax's atmosphere, kept at bay that day, a sign the more pious of its citizens counted as an exceedingly auspicious one. Zaphan's procession was immense, and the crowds of pilgrims in its wake even more so. It had been quite unlike anything the armory world had seen in millennia, and, after conferring upon the waiting garrison his most sincere blessing, and after a perfunctory meeting with the Master Prefect of the Munitorum to conclude formalities, the Cardinal retired to the Ecclesiarchal Palace with his inner circle, the grateful and smiling Mammon at their head. Little was seen of the Cardinal following these initial meetings. Contrary to the expectations of both the Munitorum officiates and the endangered workforces who had heard so many rumors of his willingness to preach, Zaphan rarely made any public appearances or addresses, occasionally visiting the shrine at St. Leonis's remains to pay quiet homage, much to the delight of whatever pilgrims were lucky enough to be present in the Basilica at the time. Few were admitted to his presence, and those that were did so only with the permission of Deacon Mammon. The prelate had taken over management of the public face of the cardinal, assuring inquirers that Zaphan was deep in contemplation over matters spiritual, working day and night on behalf of the people of Scarus. Life on Vrax began to return to normal. The workers forgot the Cardinal's presence as their overseers demanded higher quotas to make up for the time lost by the arrival ceremonies. Administratum and Munitorum officials returned to the daily toil of storage management, shipping manifests, and deployment scheduling. 
the sisters of the Order of the Argent Shroud, content that their charge was protected by the fortress and garrison as much as their own presence, took up residence in the chancel priory, attached to the basilica, electing now to be an honor guard to the relics of the departed saint. Days turned to months. Life was regular, and all the while, in secret, Zaphan labored. The first steps of his war of faith were being laid. He had already elected, at Mammon's urging, not to dispatch missives to Terra, as the urgency this upcoming crusade dictated that such channels would only present an unacceptable delay. A war, of course, would need an army. Zaphan already had his corps, the militant pilgrims still encamped outside the citadel awaiting his word, but he would need more. While functionally disallowed from doing so, Mammon had already seen to this, a legal loophole granted to the Ministorum by the presence of the Basilica, which, as an imperial holy site, contained sanctified relics, and was permitted in times of conflict and threat to raise a fratiris militia in its own defense. By the Cardinal's direction, Mammon sent the most trusted of his missionaries out to the work camps and hab blocks to spread the word of Zaphan. Their sermons began as military-tinged rhetoric, extolling the virtues of service to the Emperor and death in his name and in defense of his realm. From there, they called curses upon the hateful eye that squatted in the skies of the world, baleful and apocalyptic. And finally, they spread word that heretical forces were already abroad in the Skara sector, pillaging their way from planet to planet and butchering all those loyal to the throne that they could find. Many a preacher invoked the trials faced by the departed St. Leonis, whose torture at the hands of heretics, simply for doing the word of the God Emperor, was now being replicated across dozens, nay, hundreds of worlds. Vrax was next, the missionaries swore. Would these workers stand idly by and let it fall? Or would they rise in its defense, pledging their lives to the cause of protecting all that was good and holy in this galaxy? The atmosphere of life upon Vrax was slowly charged until it fairly crackled with zealotry. Open displays of religious fervor became at first commonplace and then expected. Gangs of Freiteris militiamen, unarmed, yes, but violent, patrolled the work camps, enforcing the Cardinal's word, or their interpretation of it, whenever they saw fit. Their influence extended over the garrison, granting them legitimacy, and all those who were found to harbor thoughts against the Cardinal or his word were surrendered to the just-as-sympathetic Arbites, dragged into the depths of the Citadel's dungeons for correctional torture. Within the Cardinal Palace, Deacon Mammon was personally working to establish an inner circle for his master, one that could be trusted to obey the words of Zaphan without question. Drawn from the ranks of the Freiteris, Mammon selected those with talents or ruthlessness he deemed necessary, creating a fanatical group known as the Disciples. The proximity to power that this group offered was additional enticement to the commanders of the local garrison, who Mammon was quick to flatter and cajole, or even bribe with the Cardinal's vast wealth, should the simple appeals to piety prove insufficient. Where all else failed, the inroads the deacon had now made would allow his sufficient influence to remove the remaining holdouts and have them reassigned or replaced by those amenable to the Cardinal's cause. Eventually, all could be relied upon to heed any wishes Zaphan may express. None were under his command in the strictest sense. There was no usurpation of the direct line of command authority, it is true, but in practice this was merely semantics. Every officer of the garrison was the Cardinals. The only holdout were the local Adeptus Arbites, who had been deliberately excluded from Mammon's machinations for fear of a misunderstanding of purpose, or so the deacon would claim when pressed. Mammon's work and Zaphan's word were working their way through the population of Rax with stunning rapidity. 
The laborers of the world drank in the sermons of their supposed champion. Grasping for hope amidst a life they knew would be hard, short, and painful. Indentured servitude to the whims of the administratum, or indeed any branch of the imperial regime, is not the worst fate imaginable in this galaxy of ours, but neither is it one that any of us would choose. Zaphan, through the ministrations of his preachers, gave them what they had not received, well, ever, recognition. He made them feel that the eyes of the emperor were upon them. The god of humanity required their service in ways greater than their limited minds could ever imagine, offering them an escape from the menial drudgery of their existences. That bred a form of devotion that is ordinarily admirable, but quite dangerous should it be turned to wicked means, means which the watchful eyes of the Inquisition were ever wary of, eyes which were now turning upon Vrax. Despite Deacon Mammon's efforts, the Ordo Hereticus had taken note of Zaphan's works upon the fortress world. Word had reached the subsector officiates of the Cardinal's preachings, and many within the Conclave believed the warning signs were there. Sequesterment, the build-up of power and influence, the development of a close inner circle, the divestment of authority to sanctioned gangs, the encouragement of fanaticism and blind loyalty. These were standard practices of the Ministorum, yes, but only when properly conducted in the open and with deference to the appropriate authorities higher up the chain. This cardinal was conducting his business seemingly at his own behest, and this could not be allowed to continue. Too often has the Ordo Hereticus been called to put down such prelates of the Ecclesiarchy, for too many have been unable to avoid the temptations power has promised them. Curtailment of said, through, let us say, preventative measures, was the Hereticus' preferred means to combat such outcomes. Better to nip any potential concerns off the vine, lest they destructively bloom. And to that end, a preventative measure was dispatched to Vrax. An assassin of Clade Vindicare, the purveyors of the finest snipers in the entire Imperium, infiltrated the citadel with comparative ease. The pilgrim flocks were still descending on Vrax, in greater numbers now thanks to the Cardinal's presence, so despite what they may have initially believed, entry visas and proper ident tagging were not so difficult to obtain for one with the resources of the Officio Assassinorum at their disposal. After that, it was merely a matter of applying careful surveillance to security measures, guard movements, and the routine comings and goings of the Citadel for the assassin to find the optimum spot to lay his ambush, and then utilize the legendary patience of the Vindicare until the opportune moment presented itself. History could have taken an entirely different course were it not for what happened next. His scope trained upon the Cardinal's palace, the assassin had espied his chance, and took it. A single shot, a heavy penetrator round, pierced the wall and cut clean through a decorative pillar, only to be turned aside when it struck Zaphan himself. Although floored by the shot, the Cardinal had taken precautions, his suspicions having grown more acute during his time on Vrax, and had obtained a personal refractor field. His life wards, Fratiris Zealots all, rushed to protect him, with two more of their number being pulped by repeated rounds from the Vindicare operative. Had they not, it is possible the refractor field would have collapsed under the assault. But that moment never came to pass. The assassin had missed his shot against all odds, and knew he must exfiltrate immediately. The citadel erupted as word of the attack spread. Treachery, treachery was here at last. The heretics had struck, the cardinal saved by a miracle, and now was the time for the faithful to prove their worth. Despite his best laid plans, the escape route of the Vindicare was swarmed by frenzied acolytes, forcing his hand and his quiet departure to turn hot. The chase took him and his pursuers through the depths of the citadel, into the vaults of the basilica itself, shots blasting to and fro between hunters and hunted. Cornered, the guards were able to shower enough grenades at the assassin to disable him before finally killing the operative in a hail of bullet fire, at the cost of dozens of their own. Regardless, the security forces of Rax had succeeded. 
and the body of the Cardinal's would-be killer was dragged above ground for public display, lest anyone harbor doubts of the attack or possess any ideas of defying the great Zaphan. Matters worsened, and rapidly. Akin to a hive of insects that had been disturbed, Furor gripped the citadel as all the worst fears of the faithful were apparently manifesting before their very eyes, fears they had been conditioned to expect. Rioting spread from the citadel throughout the laborer camps to the starport. Fraterus militia demanded access to the armories to arraign themselves for a battle they knew would soon be hence, and the garrison, under Deacon Mammon's direction, threw open the doors for them. Weapons and ammunition were showered upon the pilgrims, who seized upon any and all supplies they could. The Arbiter's attempts to restore order were utterly futile, with the Citadel branch soon finding itself besieged by mobs of Freiteris now armed to the teeth. It did not stop there. Militiamen moved out of the Citadel and into the industrial zones. Everywhere the workers of Rax ceased production and threw down their tools, rising up against their overseers at the extolling of Zaphonite preachers in their midst. Desperate, the master prefect of Rax, a munitorum man to his core, ordered the garrison to put down the uprising that was now becoming almost total, but found his orders countermanded by word from the cardinal's office. This was a religious affair, they said. The war of faith had begun at last. The master prefect had failed in his duty to keep the heretic from the shores of Rax, and now the world's defense must lie with the faithful. Attempts by the prioress of the sororitas to intercede on behalf of law and order only resulted in her being clapped in irons and thrown into the dungeon, with the rest of her mission similarly seized, although some sold their lives dearly in the process. With nothing in their way, the Zaphonites, under Deacon Mammon's explicit direction, stormed the offices of the Munitorum, killing the helpless master prefect as he fled to his personal shuttle. The astropaths, frantically screaming distress calls into the ether, were put to the bayonet. Outside in the labor camps and hab blocks, chaos reigned, but the citadel of Rax had fallen for the first time in its millennia-long history and had fallen from within. Cardinal Zaphan, recovered from the attempt on his life, was now the sole unchallenged ruler of Rax. What would come next would be simply years of punishing, unrelenting, and apocalyptic slaughter, the likes of which are remarkable, even by the Imperium standards. That account must However, wait for another day. Until such time, Ave Imperator, Gloria, in Excelsis Terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash oculusimperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.